Hi, my name is David. I'm a PhD student at the Uppsala University in Sweden. And in this talk, I'll discuss how one can analyze calibration of probabilistic models in Julia. These uh, slides, or rather this Pluto notebook, uh, will be available online as well, so you can play around with the examples. So first of all, what are probabilistic models? So the main characteristic of these models is that they output a probability distribution, as the name indicates, uh, instead of just a single target. And the idea and the motivation for these models is that uh, by outputting a probability distribution, we can capture the uncertainty in the prediction. It can arise both from some inherent stochasticity in the prediction task, but also be caused uh, by insufficient knowledge or insufficient data. I use the term target here um, because this is not restricted to classification problems. Nevertheless, um, for uh, illustration purposes, I will uh, mostly use a classification example in this talk. And uh, this classification example is uh, yeah, predicting a penguin species. And we use uh, the Polymer Penguin dataset for this. And this dataset consists of measurements uh, of, for example, the bill length and the flipper length of different penguins in the Antarctica. And these uh, penguins, they belong to the three different species of Chinstrap, Chentu, and the Dali penguins. And when we look at the bill length and the flipper length, then uh, this is this distribution of the measurements for these different penguins. And now we just initially uh, train a very simple probabilistic model uh, for these uh, features uh, to be able to predict the probability of the penguin species. So here we will make the prediction based on the bill length and the flipper length. And then uh, more generally, we usually denote the features uh, by x, so the bill length and the flipper length, that would be x here, and the targets by y, so that would be the penguin species in this case. And uh, we train here a Gaussian naive Bayes classifier, that means we fit this Gaussian distribution to the different clusters, which you can see here. And then uh, when the model is trained, we can finally make uh, probabilistic predictions. And uh, when we make a prediction for a specific feature x, um, then we denote this probability distribution with p underscore x to denote this, that it depends on the, on the uh, features x. And um, yeah, here's such an example. Um, where the bill length is 43 and the flip length was 140. And then the model predicts that, uh, okay, it's with around 20% probability and a Delhi penguin, it's with around 80% probability a chin strap penguin, and uh, basically with 0% probability it's a Gen 2 penguin. I also try to visualize uh, these probabilistic predictions in this plot, but it's a uh, it's a bit difficult to, to plot the probabilities for all uh, three penguin species at, uh, uh, in one plot. Um, but it's supposed to show the isoclines of the uh, different uh, probabilities. And yeah, of course it overlaps at the boundaries between the different clusters. Uh, but this is just one very specific example uh, of a probabilistic model for this prediction task. And so, so we could have chosen some other model as well. Ideally, of course, we would uh, like a model that actually predicts the true probability distribution of the target for uh, a given feature. Um, but since usually we learn these models from a finite data set, uh, this is not possible. So the, the main motivation for using these probabilistic uh, models was that we want to 
capture the uncertainty in the prediction task. And so that means that it's not sufficient to just predict any uh, probability distribution. So, so it's not sufficient to just output some random uh, vectors where the entry is sum up to one in the, in the classification case. Um, and there, there's this very, very classic example of a weather forecaster that always predicts um, probability of rain for the next day. And so imagine that this forecaster, she predicts 80% uh, probability of rain uh, for an infinite sequence of days. So it's so a very, very long run. You observe uh, the forecasts and then the actual uh, outcomes, if it rained or not the next day. And then these predictions, these forecasts are consistent and correspond to the actual uncertainties uh, uh, in the prediction task if in 80% of the days it actually rained. Because this means even though the forecaster was not completely certain uh, whether it will rain or not the next day, uh, but still the, the uncertainties, they, they were reliable and match uh, with uh, the empirically observed outcomes. They, they correspond to reality. And so, uh, more mathematically, um, we uh, get this uh, definition for calibration that you can see in the gray box. So, uh, we want that for, for all predictions, the prediction P of X matches the distribution of uh, the targets uh, given all the features for which we get this prediction. And uh, in the in the polymer penguin uh, example, this means the predictions that would be this categorical distributions. So, for example, 80% probability for a Delhi penguin, 10% for a chinstrap, 10% for a Chentu penguin, and then we would, uh, yeah, uh, observe all the the outcomes or which penguin species it actually was for, for, for a large number of these predictions where we had 80% probability a Delhi penguin, 10% uh, probability for a chinstrap penguin and 10% probability for a Chentu penguin. And then if the model is calibrated, these empirical frequencies would match uh, the predicted categorical distribution. I also want to emphasize here that uh, calibration, this consistency property, it really only deals with the prediction of the model. It does not matter how we obtain the model, if we chose it at random, if we used a, a frequentist approach, or if we used a Bayesian model. And also often uh, you will see a weaker notion of calibration, in particular the so-called confidence calibration, where one only focuses on the uh, most confident class. So, so in this uh, specific example here with the penguins, we only focus then on the 80% probability prediction for uh, the Delhi penguin and don't care about the predictions for the other two penguin species. And uh, instead of using uh, a different framework and a different uh, analysis, um, we, we can use uh, all the tools uh, that I'll talk about uh, in this presentation because uh, it just corresponds to a slightly less informative model. So instead of considering this free class classification model, uh, we reduce uh, it to a binary classification case where we only care about uh, whether the most confident class was actually observed or not. And this very general definition uh, of calibration that I uh, introduced above, it also captures other target spaces so where we don't deal with uh, classification. Like if uh, we deal with count data or regression problems or yeah, graphical models even. Uh, and one thing to note is that, uh, yeah, so 
there are calibrated models. That's what the result in the gray box shows us, which is good. So, so it's a, a, a property that, that's actually satisfied by some models. Um, and uh, yeah, two main conclusions from this result are that actually the, the ideal model, so the model where we uh, predict the true probability distribution of the target, that is always calibrated, but also the very, very naive uh, model where we just predict the marginal distribution of the targets uh, independent of the features, um, this one is also calibrated. This already shows that calibration is not the only aspect that we care about uh, when it comes to probabilistic models. Because, yeah, I mean, this very naive constant uh, model is uh, probably uh, not so useful in most of the cases. Okay, but then how can we check if a model is calibrated? How can we analyze calibration? And for binary uh, classification problems, uh, we can inspect calibration visually uh, by plotting the confidence values, so the predictions, versus the empirically observed outcomes. And uh, you can do this in Julia with the package reliability diagrams.jl. This package supports both plots and the makey. And uh, it also uh, yeah, has different features that I'll show uh, now here. Um, so first of all, the, the, the classic reliability diagram, there you look at uh, the uh, confidence values and the empirically observed uh, outcomes. And since usually we only observe every confidence value and every prediction only once, uh, we have to average uh, the outcomes uh, over a group of uh, predictions. And that's what's indicated here with uh, the bins. So we then just compute the average of the outcomes in every bin. Uh, and that's plotted, plotted in the blue line here for the Palmer a penguin model. And ideally, if the model is calibrated, then uh, yeah, for a prediction, for example, of 0 0.9, uh, the empirically observed frequency would also be 0 0.9. And this is indicated by the dotted line. And uh, we can see that uh, for some of the values we're above uh, the dotted line above the ideal. So that means we were under confident because actually the empirically observed frequencies were larger and in some range were below uh, this ideal line. And uh, so then we were overconfident. And uh, sometimes it can be difficult to uh, yeah, really assess visually how large the deviation from the ideal is. And so instead one can plot the deviation um, so normalize everything to to this diagonal and uh, another um, useful tool is these consistency bars so these bars indicate the range of values that we would expect if the model is calibrated so now we actually see that yeah even though there is some deviation here but uh, uh, we also had very few samples uh, in this in this bin, so uh, uh, just by randomness, we we might expect some some deviation. And uh, yes, so so this can be uh, very helpful. Of course, you can use uh, different numbers of bins, and you can also diff uh, use different binning algorithms. So, for example, uh, use bins where the proportion of prediction is uh, roughly the same. And all of this is part of reliabilitydiagrams.jl. But now, uh, when it comes to more general uh, models, and uh, yeah, even in the binary classification case, it can be useful to not only uh, inspect uh, calibration visually, but to get some score, some number that's easier also than to, to compare different models with. And this is exactly what the expected calibration error does. It's defined as the average deviation of these predictions and the 
uh, empirically observed frequencies. And um, it's evaluated with respect to some distance measure for a classification models where the predictions and these empirical frequencies are elements in the probability simplex. We can just use uh, Euclidean distance or squared Euclidean distance. For more general models, uh, yeah, one has to resort to, for example, statistical divergences like uh, kullberg leibler divergence or Wasserstein distance or the maximum mean discrepancy. Um, there are some uh, challenges with the expected uh, calibration error. Um, for more general uh, models, this uh, distribution of the targets can be arbitrarily complex, even if we constrain the predictions to be just normal distributions. Uh, these empirical frequencies are also difficult to estimate uh, e already in the classification case. And uh, as you saw in the, in the reliability diagrams, um, then one approach, uh, the most common approach, is to uh, bin uh, different predictions uh, because we only observe uh, yeah, most of the predictions once. And unfortunately, this then leads to biased and inconsistent estimators. Uh, the package calibration errors.jl can be used to estimate the expected calibration error. And the, the main API is uh, just you construct the estimator and then you evaluate it with the predictions and the uh, empirically observed outcomes. And uh, you can do this for different distance measures uh, and for different binning algorithms and also different numbers of bins. And of course, the, the estimate then varies uh, depending on the number of bins. Um, there are also alternatives, actually, to the expected calibration error. And uh, one alternative we proposed recently, it's based on the uh, observation that instead of comparing every prediction with uh, the empirical frequency, you can also compare these two joint distributions that are uh, shown here. So on the left-hand side, we have the joint distribution of the prediction and the target. And on the right-hand side, we have the joint distribution of the prediction and this artificial variable set, which is distributed according to the prediction. And um, so, so this uh, naturally suggests that one can analyze uh, calibration by comparing and measuring the distance between these two different uh, joint distributions. And uh, one class of such distance measures uh, for probability distributions are integral probability metrics. Uh, and they, they are kind of neat because they, they make only a very few assumptions about the uh, involved distributions. Uh, one particular choice is the maximum mean discrepancy, uh, which we use to define the kernel calibration error. So the, this uh, calibration error is just the maximum mean discrepancy between these two uh, joint distributions. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very general uh, calibration error that applies to all probabilistic predictive models, also regression uh, uh, models or graphical models, or yeah, you name it. And uh, in the literature, uh, there there's uh, uh, unbiased and uh, consistent estimators of the MMD that also uh, avoid the challenging estimation of these empirical frequencies, uh, which is very helpful. And uh, of course, in, in, the, in the default setting, that you don't have this artificial random variable, um, so we can improve the standard estimators uh, by marginalizing out the set variable or uh, if this is not possible analytically, uh, we can always draw as many samples from uh, set as as we want. And uh, yeah, so so this helps as well. Um, this is also part of calibration errors .jl. Um, a lot of different uh, estimators with different sample complexity. And I would say the most important thing here is, that we don't implement uh, specific kernels in kernel functions, but instead you can use 
the kernels uh, that are defined in the package kernel functions or defined in other packages with this interface. And so, for example, here we could use also squared exponential kernel, we could use a uh, matern kernel and uh, use different estimators. And for this specific choice of a kernel uh, that I used here, we, uh, we uh, get this specific value. Um, one can, of course, change the, the length scale of the involved kernels and then we'll get different estimates. Now, uh, you may wonder how to choose the length scale. And there, there are uh, existing approaches in the MMD literature. Um, for example, one can uh, maximize the uh, kernel calibration error on a held out data set uh, and select the length scale in this way. And as I said, this, this applies to uh, general probabilistic uh, models as well. And so I just quickly go over this example. Here we have a Gaussian process uh, with some training and some validation data. And uh, there the, the predictions, the marginal predictions are just uh, normal distributions. And uh, so we can use another kernel that is uh, suited for uh, Gaussian distributions, for example, one can use the two Wasserstein distance uh, for measuring the distance between Gaussian distributions. And then we can also evaluate the kernel calibration error for such models shown here. One general problem with all these calibration errors is that it's difficult to actually uh, yeah, interpret the values that you get, the estimates. It's unclear if a value of 0 0.01, for example, if that indicates that the model is almost calibrated or if it indicates that the model is completely uncalibrated. So there's no clear range or scale of, of these values often. And uh, also different calibrations error rank models differently. And even if the model, the actual model is uh, calibrated, that just because we estimate everything from finite data sets, we expect that also for calibrated models, uh, usually the, the estimate is non-zero. So you can't rule out that the model is calibrated just because the error is non-zero. So an alternative approach is to perform uh, hypothesis tests of calibration. And uh, there we try to estimate the p-value of uh, the null uh, hypothesis that the model is calibrated. This you can see indicated in the plot here. And uh, uh, also with the reformulation with the two joint distribution, this just indicates that calibration tests, these are basically just special two sample tests. And there is a vast literature about two sample tests. Uh, again, here we, we can, uh, yeah, uh, with our artificial random variable, we can marginalize it out or draw more samples. So we can improve uh, existing tests in the literature. And all these different tests are implemented in calibration tests.jl. Uh, there are some tests that are uh, uh, based on asymptotic properties of the kernel calibration error. And uh, some of the tests are uh, based on uh, distribution free bounds of this p value. But uh, these bounds are usually then very loose. So this means that the tests usually would not reject the null hypothesis. And so they are not very useful in practice. Um, the package uses the uh, hypothesis test.jl interface. And so you also get these nice printouts here where you can see the, the point estimate, if the null hypothesis was rejected or what the value would be under uh, the null hypothesis. And we can perform these tests both with the polymer penguin model and the Gaussian process model. And so last but not least, I want to mention that there are also interfaces uh, of these packages for Python and R. And uh, basically this is based and inspired by the interfaces for the differential equations uh, ecosystem in Julia. And uh, you just load the package, you install the Julia dependencies, and then you can use the, basically the same code as you would uh, use in Julia to perform all the analysis, both with Python 
and with R. Okay, and now at the end of my talk, I just want to quickly summarize and, and point out yeah, five main take home messages, I'd say. So first of all, I think calibration is an important aspect because it uh, guarantees that actually the probabilistic uh, predictions are somewhat meaningful. Um, for binary classification problems, or if you reduce your problem to such a binary case, you can inspect calibration with reliability diagrams and the consistency bars can be very helpful. There exist also alternatives to the uh, very well-known expected calibration errors, such as this kernel calibration error. Calibration tests can resolve some of the interpretability issues of calibration error estimates. And if you don't uh, use Julia, we have some Python and R interfaces available for you. Thank you for listening and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you all at JuliaCon. Thanks.